Thank you for coming to this event. It's a long time in the making. I have to say that CII is about five years uh, uh, culmination of a vision that we had at IWP. So today is really the first step into the reality of that. So thank you for coming and sharing this day with us. Before we get started, I'd like to thank um, and recognize several people uh, today. Uh, first of all, our extraordinary keynote speakers, uh, General Michael Hayden, who will be here later, John Simone, Peter Singer, Jim Richburg. I'd like to thank uh, the IWP Board of Trustees, some who are here today. Thank you all. They, um, they supported us from the very beginning with CII, even though we weren't really sure uh, when we were going to be doing what. They, they, they uh, provided tremendous support every step, in the way, step of the way, so thank you. I also want to thank the IWP staff and faculty who've worked over time <laughs> for many weeks now to make this happen. So, so several of them are in the, the room today, so thank you to all of you. And then I'd like to, to identify the CII working team and the CII board of advisors and founding team. So most of which are in this room. So I'd like to go through and identify them. So raise your hand when I say your name. Uh, first of all, Professor John Sugonis, who you've just met. He's a founding member of, of CII. Professor John Sano. He's an IW professor and former CIA deputy, deputy director for National Clandestine Services. John, I know you were here somewhere. There you are. Thank you. And C.W. Walker, who is an IWP alum. And he is on our CII Board of Advisors, and he is the lead instructor for the Cyber Intel Threat Analyst Certification. And Marianne Garner, who's not here today, but she's the CII Marketing Director. Carlos Colazzo, I think I saw you. Yes, Carlos is on uh, CII Board of Advisors as well, and he's principal of Duclaw, and Duclaw is CII's <coughs> first strategic partner. And Carlos also heads up, uh, he's the lead instructor for the Cyber Intelligence for Business Executives <coughs> certification later this afternoon as well. Also, G.S. McNamara. G.S. McNamara is uh, a working team member, and he's a white hat hacker working at Force, Force Point, Raytheon Cybersecurity Products Company. And Maria Hayden. Maria. Maria. Maria is a DIA Cyber Intel analyst, and she's a master's student at NIU for Cyber Intel and she's one of our founding members as well. Also, Patricia Schuker, IWP candidate for master's degree in national security. And she's currently at our Oxford program in, um, uh, she's at our Oxford program in Oxford. So she, <laughs> she can't be here, but she, I think, is having a great time uh, studying in Oxford. And next, Derek Dorch, who couldn't be here today. He's IWP's director of career services and special programs. And, uh, and a founding member of CII. And a uh, new addition to the team is Robert Whitmore. He's a CPA for Foresight Strategy, Finance, and Leadership. And he is a CII Special Financial Advisor. So with that, what we'd like to, to go through this morning, just very, very high level, is what is CII? Um, when, as we go through, Jeff and I are going to kind of go back and forth, but please, if you have any questions, we'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have one, just raise your hand. It's very informal, and we'd love to, to answer your questions as we go. Um, what is CII? I'd like, to start, I'd like to start with three points of CII today. And what are these three points? The first is CII has really extended IDBP's focus on traditional statecraft, national security, strategic intelligence, international affairs, into the cyber domain. This, this was a big deal for IWP. IWP has a very strong niche focused on those traditional statecraft, uh, <coughs> on traditional statecraft and uh, traditional tradecraft in the intel and national security communities. So to move into the cyber domain was quite a, quite a big change of, of IWP's uh, multidisciplinary approach. But this is what CII has focused to do. So what we have done is take those tools of a nation, the statecraft, and apply it to the cyber domain and, uh, and take the tools of a business, what we call corporate statecraft. How are those traditional business tools, how can they be put together in an academic program to focus on what we're calling cyber intelligence. In a moment, Jeff is going to um, 
going to define cyber intelligence, <laughs> and, and then that, actually that's right, that's you're right. supposed to do that. We're um, <laughs> <laughs> supposed to do that first. Um, yeah, so, so I think what we do is you're, define the cyber intelligence, and then we'll come back and talk about um, the, the other components of CII. Go ahead. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. A um, couple things before, before we quickly get into definition. Broadly speaking, in cybersecurity globally, let alone nationwide, let alone companies and agencies and nation, et cetera, et cetera, people as an industry have been growing in this space uh, in a very defensive posture way, right? Defending ourselves, defending our networks, making sure we've got antivirus and malware and all the things you have to do to protect yourself. Cyber intelligence represents a offensive, so to speak, or proactive view of cybersecurity within your organization. It takes a variety of different components of information and data uh, and provides you actionable steps to take. That is the, the foundational perspective that we have on this. <clears throat> Our definition, and granted there is some change to this depending on what organizations you're with. I've been with different organizations who define this a little differently, but essentially, cyber intelligence is the comprehensive assessment of an adversary's intentions, capabilities, and the intelligence activities, processes, operations, and information obtained through cyberspace. So in other words, Big mouthful, I know, but uh, in other words, cyber intelligence gives an organization, an individual, an agency, the ability to do, really see th the tea leaves. Look forward. Why am I being attacked? Why would I be attacked? Why would I be a victim? Uh, what are the tools, techniques, methods that somebody would come after me for? Right? This, this represents a growing shift of perspective when it comes to cybersecurity. As I said earlier today, so many organizations manage cybersecurity from a very defensive posture perspective. And cyber intelligence is not that. It's taking everything, giving you information so then you can go do something with it very much more proactive than anything we've seen before. Uh, you know, cybersecurity as an industry has matured so much in the last 10 years, 12 years, yet it's still very new, very young uh, as an industry, as a uh, way of doing business and how it's understood, the application of cybersecurity globally uh, is definitely within its infancy. But as we've seen more organizations grow and more frustration, as was mentioned earlier from the OPM breach, <coughs> we've seen organizations and agencies get more frustrated uh, about all these attacks. No one wants to hear about another breach, another problem, another whatever. Cyber intelligence gives people and organizations the ability to see that coming. Uh, again, this is a maturity process that we're talking about. But that's what our, our focus is, as developing a cyber intelligence initiative, is starting to help people look forward and plan and see what they need to do and see what's coming and why should they be concerned? Why should, would their agency be a victim? You know, OPM we, gets talked about quite a bit. Uh, and the idea behind you know, applying cyber intelligence to an organization of that size would have helped. Uh, and I've had these conversations, so I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn here. But having a, a better cyber intelligence capability would have helped OPM and the org internally within the organization understand why would they be a victim, why would they be a target, and what they can do uh, to protect themselves. Uh, so that's, that's really, we have seen a, uh, a vacuum in the marketplace for this type of knowledge and understanding. It shows up in pockets, in areas, but it's not very strong, thought through, or methodical. Uh, and as was mentioned earlier, mapping what we're doing with IWP uh, and leveraging all the scholar practitioners, we just realized, wow, this is, this is tremendous. You've got a great body of knowledge of people, and we've got expertise in cybersecurity. It's a great mating point. So that's really a broader reason and value proposition is why we're doing this. Um, and this isn't going away. I mean, all the research that we did before over the last six, seven, eight, nine months, um, there's nobody doing this. A lot of people talk about it, and that's good, but there's nobody doing this to the degree that we are which is unique and actually it was quite a surprise at first. Um, so we've, we've, the team has spent a lot of time polishing this to make it very applicable, very quick, very practical for people. So, okay. Now your main points. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so just to recap, the, the, first, the first point is CII extending IWP's focus into the cyber domain. That's, that was our first initiative. Uh, the second important point Really is the most important part of our launch today of CII is the, cy the cyber intelligence certifications. What are those? CII has developed seven professional certifications in the cyber intelligence arena, and, and IWP is a certifying body for these certifications. There are no other cyber intelligence certifications in the market today. So, 
at least not not as of a week ago. So <laughs> we, um, um, it, but it's a very fast uh, changing industry, as as you all know. But we we have what we think we have defined this need, and we are going to create what we hope will be the most uh, widely used non-technical cyber intelligence certifications in the market. And so what are these certifications? Um, as, as was said earlier, we will do uh, an overview of all seven of them in the breakout sessions later today. But uh, in the meantime, let me just give you a quick overview of what it is not. The, the CII professional certifications are less focused on the technology and engineering aspects of cybersecurity. There are many certifications in the cyber technology and engineering domain today. They're very valuable. We focus on a different aspect of that. It is more on the strategic and operational aspects of cyber risk assessments and the understanding of the, the geopolitical threats of our real world adversaries. Now, this is important because as, as we've seen, our real-world adversaries, as we say, are the same adversaries that we are seeing in the cyber domain. Just look at China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, ISIS even. So it's important to have a, an understanding of what the geopolitical world is. And if you're, if you're an organization, whether you're OPM or whether you're, let's say, Verizon, uh, or let's say Cisco, someone with a lot of intellectual property, to know who your adversaries are not just from a technical digital f fingerprint standpoint, but from a, from a strategy or a geopolitical perspective. And I, I would submit that if OPM, people in charge of running the network at OPM, had read China's unrestricted warfare book, they would have probably had a better idea that China would have valued their information with a very, very high regard because that is, that is their strategy. And, and this is where a geopolitical understanding of, of, a, of uh, what CII teaches can really help left of boom. That is not just with a technology uh, operational tactical team, as great as they could be in technology with all the latest and greatest software and hardware, that's great. But that, that is not enough. We think that what you need to have an understanding of, okay, I think that this Chinese company really wants my intellectual property, so how can we proactively defend our networks from, from particular cyber adversaries? We're finding that's becoming a very valuable part of business leaders and government leaders, organizations to say, okay, how can we prepare ourselves a little bit better, shore up these vulnerabilities? Can I add a quick thing to that too, excuse me. <coughs> um, <coughs> Again, as we, as we mentioned, the application of cyber intelligence, both in the government domain, would help a lot of organizations that we've, have, have, as we've discussed, but also cyber intelligence as applied to the corporate domain, as Michelle mentioned, is a huge important thing. Right? Uh, MedStar, uh, wow, the Presbyterian Hospital in, in California, a right? handful of organizations and situations that we, you can all recall where it was very, a situation was going on, a company's doing business, they don't understand the intelligence aspect of what they're doing, the value that, that their company actually provides, and how much of a target they are. And again, this is why we, we've done a lot of research and, and we feel pretty strongly about the fact that cyber intelligence can both flip to government agencies and help them understand what's going on, but also empower corporations and what they're doing and what they understand, the, the C-level, the senior technologists within a company, and understand how cyber intelligence can impact business decisions, technical purchases, partnerships, cooperations, etc. Uh, so that's a really important point to hammer on, right? Cyber intelligence is ubiquitous in that point that no, not only nations and government agencies, but also corporations. Uh, and this is, again, we're not talking the ones and zeros aspect of this. We're talking the application of cybersecurity to business, to governments, right? That's what we're really emphasizing and working on, so. Thank you. So and then to the third point, um, CII is the why. What does that mean? I have to give a shout out to Ron Carback at DIA for giving me this, uh, th this little setup. But essentially it is, when you, if you're an organization who's just had a cyber breach, a cyber attack, first thing you do is go, what happened? And then you say, who did this? And how did they do it? The who and the how, those questions must be answered with a really good technical understanding of, of cybersecurity and computing, right? But we at IDP, CII, think that it's just as important, if not important, to know why were you attacked? Why were we attacked? 
in order to answer that question of why, you need a really good understanding of the realities of, of, of your adversaries today, the real world and the cyber domain. So that is why we say CII is the why. It's because CII teaches the fundamental understanding that you need to have to effectively answer that why. So this is an example. Um, when you look at this slide, you, you can see, identify how uh, traditional statecraft, which IWP teaches, are things of military action, political warfare, information operations, etc. That's the core of what we call traditional statecraft, the non-technical side. On the corporate side, we have corporate statecraft, the things that, that the aspects of running a company that every CEO has experienced, whether it's a two-person company or a 500,000 person company, person company. Those are the things you've got to manage. The challenge is really the application of cybersecurity <clears throat> and cyber intelligence to those different domains and those different areas. That's not well understood. Today in corporate America, you've got people running around who want to buy the next firewall, uh, the next IDS, the next technical whatever to secure their network, which is not a bad thing. But having to understand, explain, apply all of that technology purchase and all that technology conversation into actual business architecture, actual business product and service has been a challenge. That's what we, we do here. That's our focus. We want to talk about the application of cyber intelligence to both sides of this. Because again, one, nobody is, and two, you can't do much of business, whether it's government business or corporate business, without understanding technology, without understanding cybersecurity to some degree, and why passwords are important, uh, and why your data is extremely important to somebody else, and how is that data protected. So those are important things that we want to keep in mind through everything you hear today. Right? Cyber intelligence as applied to traditional statecraft areas. There's a lot of folks in government that do great at their job, but could do a little better in their job if they knew and understood cybersecurity and cyber intelligence. What does that mean? Right? Those conversations many of us have had on a regular basis. Um, you know, how to apply cybersecurity and cyber intelligence to Department of Defense, military operations, national security, uh, <clears throat> economic espionage, what does that mean? So that's really uh, some points we really want to emphasize. And when it comes to, to corporate statecraft, again, you can't run a business in this country without having a conversation about mobile devices, cloud, uh, and how to protect your own IP. Right? Those are just natural conversations you have to have. But what we're trying to do, and what we're going to do, and what we help people figure out, is how does that data make sense so you can make the best decisions possible? which again is the impetus for, for what we're doing here. I'll just add to that. Oh, go back. Yep. Oh, back um, there's, a, there's a very large cybersecurity company, private sector, uh, public company. Actually, I think there are a few representatives here today. But they said something to us a couple of weeks ago that really stuck with me. They do simulations for private sector, big private sector corporations. And when they do these simulations, they find that when the traditional uh, threat analysts, those that might have a, uh, a tradecraft background uh, from a uh, intel, counter-intel standpoint, when those team members work closely with their, with their engineers, their tactical, technical team, when they work together in teams where they share the information of what they know about a threat, again, you're getting the technical side and the non-technical side. They said that when the teams came together and really shared that information, that those, were the, those teams were most effective in preventing the cyber attack that was later, uh, uh, was later brought into the simulation. And then they, they basically said that it was such an such a, uh, enlightening fact to the business leaders who were watching these uh, simulations occur that they then put, they implemented these teams working together in that manner on a going forward basis after the simulation, which I thought was a, a true test of, of it being a, a valid application. So with that. Back to your point. Um, yeah, it's, it's not fancy, <laughs> it's, uh, but, but we, we have found, um, we, we've talked to a lot of academic institutions, uh, a number have talked to us. No one is doing this in a holistic, comprehensive program the way that CII is providing. Not in the niche that, uh, that as Professor Zagrenos explained earlier, that, and for those of you that know IDBP, our, our focus is a, is a very small niche. 
And that is the focus that we're applying with CII. And something Isn't to think it? about too, right? So cybersecurity for cybersecurity's sake, for cyber engineers, for, if I put my technical hat on for a minute, cybersecurity for cyber guys is great. But that doesn't solve the problem. Because guys who are doing cybersecurity in companies aren't solving the broader corporate problem, the broader agency problem. It's the application of cybersecurity to whatever. That's what solves problems. That's what keeps organizations safe. That's what protects data. That gets what gives us the edge as a country and as, a, as corporations. So again, that's exactly what we're, what we're focusing on, is that perspective, right? helping people understand it's not just technology, it's how the technology is applied. Very simple concept, which we're all familiar with. But again, as this is a new industry and a new, age, new uh, era, new era of, of technology and growth and business, very few, if any, are doing it this way. Um, and we quickly discovered a gap in what that means and what that looks like. Yes, ma'am. So the question is about how we're working with Suzanne Spaulding, DHS in particular, yeah, Suzanne Spall, yeah. um, uh, and how they have the same outreach. Right? Many government agencies are trying to figure out how do government, public, private sector relationships work, what's the method that they should engage. The information sharing thing that we've, all of us have heard about is still being discovered and figured out. Um, but to your point, right, there, there is that relationship where people are talking to each other about, okay, how are we doing this and what's the approach? So there's, there's certainly various conversations that are going on we're writing from different industries and organizations where that's happening today. Right, and even yeah. if you look at CISA, the, the um, cyber information sharing bill that was recently passed, it was so that government and industry would talk together better, that they would share information better. We have to have legislation to have that happen. Is it, is it better? It's better. Is it great? No, it's not great. But it is, I understand, in getting somewhat better, especially in the fusion centers and the ISACs and the ISOs. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is more of an effort to sharing information and the executive order 13636 that basically put forth the cybersecurity framework where industry and government sharing information about, about what threats they've experienced, what threats they've seen, so that other companies can say, oh, well, I'll be looking for that in the future, so to speak. So, so yes, it, it's a good question. We're sharing as much as possible. There's always more that we could share. All right. So, so the last thing that I'd like to say about CII today is, is how we structured it. And just very simply, the, the, the first and biggest part of CII is the professional certifications that we've already talked about, and you'll hear more about this afternoon. The second part of our, of our program focuses on creating tailored programs for government and primarily um, business organizations. What does that mean? We're, for example, we're talking to two different private sector organizations right now. One, we're, we're putting together a two-day seminar where we go to their facility, big auditorium, and we put together a presentation of uh, all of our certifications and, and our courses. So, and then we're working with another organization to do something similar, but highly specialized into one certification only. So that's the second part. It's, it's a tailored, bespoke program, but it's something that we're seeing is of great interest to, to a number of government and business organizations that we've already talked to, um, and we haven't even launched it yet, but there, there does seem to be great interest for that. The third part of it, I'm going to let Jeff uh, explain. Um, in developing this program, we've, we're in contact with a lot of different universities who've indicated a strong interest in what we're doing. Uh, one, because there's a lack of talent to be able to do that, lack of expertise to be able to teach that, and two, there's a huge need for cyber intelligence, cyber security in general. I'm sure all of you are aware, right? There's the, it's a negative job market for cybersecurity professionals. There's 32 positions for every one qualified person in, the, in this area alone, uh, in this region of the country. So there's a lot of opportunity there to grow and to develop. So the relationships that we've been establishing with these universities have been very interesting. Um, again, it stretches from government universities to public-private universities uh, and organizations to discuss how this can work. Uh, so it's definitely, we see this trend and uptick of um, interest and strong, uh, strong uh, 
vision for what needs to happen here from a lot of different sources. So uh, you'll certainly be seeing more, and there'll be, we'll, we have a couple of publishing out more information on our, our, the relationships we have with different organizations, why that's important, uh, and hopefully offering this will offer more opportunities to all of you who take our courses. So. Right, so now we just want to summarize and say we look forward to seeing you at the breakout sessions later on this afternoon. If you could, if you haven't already, take a look inside the program. And the agenda is on the left hand side, obviously, and the breakout sessions are, are um, enumerated on the right hand side with a brief overview for each. You can take a look at them sometime between now and the end of lunch, get, get an idea of where you'd, uh, which ones you'd like to attend. So we're going, to, we're going to try and guess whether or not we have more people for session A than session B, and, and we'll ask you what your interest is after lunch to, to that effect. And find one of us if you have questions throughout the day or if you have to leave any early and you want to chat, whatever, or please go to the website. Too. Right. So before we close off and introduce our next speaker, anyone have any other questions or comments at this point? Sure yes, sir. question. You talk about the tech, not your uh, technical aptitude is not essential, but is there a minimum threshold of uh, my cyber I go back to my uh, minor in computer science from a state school in Alabama. It's about 30 years old. And so it's like uh, how much how much technologies or how much uh, technical ability do you really need to get into this? Yeah, it's a great question. One we get a lot, and we have addressed that, and I'll let yep. Jeff answer that. So uh, one of our courses is Cybersecurity 101 which develops that baseline of knowledge and understanding. It, it's a common, um, common thought process that people are like, well, cyber's all technical. It is technical, certainly, but you don't need to have a deep technical knowledge or background in uh, computer engineering, computer science to understand what a firewall does and why that's important to you uh, or how to protect your most important data on a network and how bad guys come after organizations and individuals. So. Um, it's a, it's a myth to a degree that you have to have all this technology to understand cybersecurity. Again, we're talking about unless you want a degree in cybersecurity, yeah. then that's a different conversation. Then there's definitely some engineering courses, et cetera, that we can introduce you to. But this is, again, about cybersecurity as applied to something, whatever area that we're talking about. Uh, but we always have a baseline knowledge. I think all of our courses have a cybersecurity 101 uh, element to that. So it kind of just it raises the water level just so everybody's on the same playing field and talking conversationally about the technical pieces to a degree, but then how those are applied. So. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. How do you incorporate the international cyber security is a worldwide Great question. Great, great, great question. question. Thank you. you question? The, uh, no, I'm going to let you do that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll add. <clears throat> right. um, great point. Can't be underscored enough, right? Cybersecurity is a global problem. Uh, part of our relationships with other academic organizations is going to help leverage some of that uh, internationally, um, whether Japan or Brussels or a few other organizations in, in parts of the world we've been having some conversations with about this. Um, but you're right. You know, being able to offer cybersecurity uh, from a perspective of national security, not just U.S. national security, but national security broadly for countries. Um, being able to provide people who attend the courses an understanding that how do you, what's information sharing look like internationally in cybersecurity, right? So IWP has a great foundation um, for all of these topics, as we talked about earlier, all the statecraft issues and how those are applied to our international partners. And with cyber intelligence, it's the same thing. We're going to leverage. The, the background, the strength of IWP, and add in these cyber courses to, just do, to do just what you said. How do you address that? How do you teach and train people? How do you encourage people? Especially in D.C., right? People from Kenya, I grew up in Rwanda, by the way, so people who grew up in Kenya, or people who are in, in different parts of the world, uh, come and live here in D.C., and there's so many, so much of a swirl of international folks. It's a great place to be able to teach and train uh, about cybersecurity internationally. So that is definitely a thrust of what we're doing. No. And in addition, in addition, we also have um, 
uh, some of our board members and some of our founding members also have companies in, in other countries, particularly in the UK and, uh, and in Switzerland. And we already have as a phase two of CII is to roll out to the UK next. We still have some friends over there that like us and we, we, we do um, trade ideas back and forth and share information. And we are meeting with uh, some people uh, in the UK when we go to Oxford next month. And we're also meeting with some representatives from the University of Geneva to have this kind of cooperative partnership discussion. But a very good question. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. <laughs> Roll <time. laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> Well, th thank thanks, you, thanks. and we'd like to talk to you and afterwards about, about this. And, and very really, one quick thing. So one of our instructors, uh, yes. Carlos, uh, uh, expertise in business and how non-government, all business and cybersecurity relates to that, and cyber intelligence relates to that. So it's on your point. Right? That's, that's a key course for the, our, our whole program, is helping people who are not government-related folks, but who are running a business, who need to understand, if I buy this, I buy that, I do this deal, I do an m and I do whatever, how does that impact the value of my company? What's the intelligence around that? Again, we saw the same thing. This is not just about government work. It's also about everybody else. Because again, as we all know, more of our infrastructure data travels on private networks. If I'm a bad guy, I'm going to go after all the small companies and medium-sized companies. I'll avoid the government because they're too big and there's already protection there to some degree. Uh, the real challenge is helping corporations figure out what cyber intelligence is and cybersecurity is and get them out of thinking it's just a firewall. Right? So just a perspective to give. Right. So thank you. Yeah, and you're right on your point. A lot of it is just we need to educate more people more. And it's, it's an oversimplification, but you can't, you can't replace it. You know, with that knowledge then comes the sharing of the right information yeah. and, and then so on and so on. Yeah. But that's a good point. Thank you. So a couple more oh. questions. Eventually. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. She's talking in Annie Jamil. For me, as a child, the Cold War, we had every citizen, every child, we all had our IT, we were all aware. So we have a new warfare, a new war, a new war. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. world where we're going to have war mm -hmm. through digital, cyber, cyber war. Mm -hmm. So we all, every child, everyone has to have a consciousness. Mm -hmm. Agreed. That's a good point. Yep. I, I once was at a conference where DHS deputy secretaries she said that one of the things that, that this country could use is like a PSA, public service announcement, on what cyber. to do and not to do in the cyber yeah. domain. Yeah. It's like yeah. what we call pricing safe cyber. Just, <laughs> so, that's a good point. So, go ahead. Yes, sir. So, good question. So, um, there are uh, there are several international European organizations that ANISA and a handful of others, to mention one, um, that are working on a variety, tracking and managing cyber information sharing, cyber op operations, essentially, how countries work individually and how they work collectively. Um, there is one UN recommendation on the table. I don't think it's been really broadly discussed, to my knowledge, maybe wrong here, but um, 
you know, you're hitting on another good point that was mentioned earlier, right? The information sharing and cybersecurity globally, and what does that look like? Again, very many people are talk not talking about that. It's just not something discussed yet. But this is why I get what we're doing, what we're doing. It's cyber intelligence applied to international cooperation. Why is that important, right? Uh, as uh, digital fingerprints are global, right? I can sit in a small room in Kenya, as an example, and hack the U.S., China, Japan, Taiwan, whatever. So that, that type of cooperation has to happen. And again, leveraging what, we've, what IWP is and has done is really why we found a, a great home for this concept of cyber intelligence and what that is, uh, to teach and train just that. You can see that our dynamics is very interactive. Um, I just wanted to, um, to introduce, and maybe a little bit contentious, I mean, let's make no mistake, the Institute of World Politics is a graduate school of higher education, and this is an education-oriented program. For the integrated strategist, someone at um, the policy level at the White House or staffers or members in Capitol Hill, people in the C-suite or up and coming in business, to understand this new domain. Um, it should be no surprise that it's given the, the, the legacy, the history of IWP in this program that is going to be American-centric. I mean, there is no question there's an international component to the expanding cyber domain, but if we're going to educate cyber counterintelligence professionals, we're probably not going to spend a lot of time trying to improve the skills of the Russians or the Chinese in their counterintelligence. Um, so this, I, I don't want people to, to, um, to leave without that understanding. This is um, an American-centric um, orientation. Um, uh, another thing I wanted to raise, um, and Michelle and I had the opportunity to brief uh, people at the White House um, a while back um, when we were developing our cyber statecraft course. And we were, I think, surprised, um, uh, happy at the same time that um, we seemed to be on the right track. I had previously served in the National Security Council, and much of my exposure to cyber was on the response. How are we going to deter and what should our national response be when attacked or constantly under assault uh, through foreign intelligence services. And that led me to, to uh, appreciate five major functions that need to be performed. And I think this is also at the core of CII. The first is to monitor. Well, in a, in a domain that is constantly evolving, what is it that you are monitoring? Who is monitoring and how are they monitoring and what are they monitoring for? Now, your IT specialist will have certainly uh, an opinion on what should be monitored, but it's probably more than just what they have purview over. And we want to introduce to, to uh, C-suite and businesses or policymakers, particularly those who are drafting legislation, when, you talk, when one talks about sharing, well, what specifically are you sharing? What are the risks of sharing if you are a company? What, what liabilities and indemnities do you incur for sharing? Um, and those details haven't been worked out. Um, the second function is detection. It's not sufficient just to monitor your system, but you, able, you have to be able to detect an anomaly. Um, you know, if, if, the, if the first exposure of Sony Entertainment is that their screens have skulls and crossbones on them, that's their detection that they've been assaulted, it's very different than if North Korean parachutists were landing on Sony Entertainment uh, facilities in California. Um, the third function is forensic analysis. Because this happens so quickly in the cyber domain, can you identify or understand what is going on? Are they stealing your information? Are they manipulating your information? I mean, thank goodness the OPM breach was a withdrawing, um, uh, copying of information. It wasn't a manipulation of it. You know, they didn't go in and they now have my social security number, but they didn't manipulate my social security number and that of 20 to 40 million other people. I mean, that would have been horrific, but it's still possible. Um, finally, or uh, fourthly, attribution. Who is doing the assault? I use an, ex uh, an, uh, an example in, in the class that Michelle and I teach that if you wanted to monitor activity in this room, people coming and going, you'd probably look at the door. At the, at the door, excuse sorry, at, at the door. But is that the only way to enter this building? Um, we were just attacked. Um, there was a very famous Chamber of Commerce meeting, very sensitive commerce meeting in uh, December of 2011, and everyone thought um, they were secure as they entered the room. The meeting was held. 
the, media, the room had been uh, scrubbed for bugs beforehand. Uh, people left their phones out, their cell phones outside the door, and they conducted their meeting. And the following Monday, um, it was recognized that the meeting had been uh, bugged because the adversaries entered the room through the thermostat, which is a, um, an it sends out an electric pulse to determine ambient temperature, sends a signal back to the HVAC system, you know, turn on the heat, turn on the cooling uh, to keep the ambient temperature where you want it. And the adversaries manipulated that, and instead of determining temperature, they were collecting voice vibrations. And the algorithm was able to recapture the conversation. Pretty sophisticated stuff, but because no one was monitoring the thermostat, no one was detecting an intrusion, and no one was conducting a real-time assessment of what was going on. So forensic analysis is critically important, going back to um, I think that the tradecraft of counterintelligence, then attribution. If the North Koreans are assaulting Sony pictures, we expect that we would see markings of North Korean planes and, and patches on uniforms, and we would expect the Air Force, the Marines, the Army, the Navy to defend, but when it's done cybernetically, we can't be sure. I served in an administration where attribution was critically important to the president. He wanted to be sure that we knew the source of an attack. And finally, response. How are we going to respond? How do we respond in the public-private sector partnership that we have? What, is Sony going to unleash itself against the North Koreans, or is the government going to step in, or is the government not going to step in but want to rein in uh, Sony's response? Why is this important? Because when you are drafting policy, whether it's at the White House or legislation in Capitol Hill or working in a company, I think these larger issues need to be appreciated by the leadership and a staff young up-and-coming strategists will, will have more answers or at least be more curious to inquire what the answers are to those questions, those functions. So we have better laws, we have better policies, we have better capabilities, and we are more secure.